I love stories. You know, I think storytelling is everything. Who wants to hear a story? Welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast presented by Hippo Direct. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur or innovator every single Wednesday morning who's unleashing creativity to grow their business. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, digital marketing dude to HippoDirect, and you can email me at max at hippodirect.com for any help with podcasting or digital marketing. This is episode number 53, and today's guest is Ryan Berman. He's the founder and chief creative officer of Fish Tank and IDEA agencies in San Diego. He started Sock Problems. And most recently, his special forces change consultancy, Courageous. His new bestseller, Return on Courage, is a result of three years he spent shadowing everyone from astronauts to Navy SEALs to business executives and more. It's time to get encouraged. Enjoy the show. All righty. We are here with Ryan Berman, the most courageous guest in podcast history. How are you doing today, Ryan? Wow. Really? It, what is this like? Are you surveying 100 people to actually say I'm the most courageous guest or how are we getting there? Yeah, well, like three or four, but we're, we're, we're getting there. You know, the results <laughs> are pouring in. <laughs> but no, yeah. No, hey, if there's anybody in, in, in addition to the lion from the Wizard of Oz, if there's anybody to look to for courage, it's you, Ryan. So, so thanks for coming on today. How are you doing? I'm doing well, man. How about yourself? Doing well as well. So we're going to get into a ton about your career. I mean, you're a super creative, in addition to courageous guy. But I do want to shout out Stephanie Liu, our mutual friend before that, because uh, you used to work with her. Uh, She was a member of your team at a previous agency that you had. And for the record, I feel like I work for her. But yes, technically she did (laughs) to me. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, that's how I felt on the podcast. Anyway, but you were introduced to this podcast through her in her LinkedIn posts. uh, And you said when you reached out to me that you were going to break all of her records. So so no pressure, Ryan. But when she was on the show, she set records for alliteration, food references, as well as the loudest noise ever made with someone's tongue. So you got all that? You good? I I, I think I'm going to be 0 for 3, actually. (laughs) <laughs> that, that, those were the records she broke. I thought gotcha. it was like most eloquent speaker or uh, oh. most courageous uh, podcaster, which I think I'm I'm winning on that one, right? Okay, wow. That, okay, spin job of the century here. But hey, uh, you know, no credit where credits due. Yeah, we don't. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll leave the alliteration records for her. Yeah, the stupendous Stephanie. But anyway, for anybody that's not familiar with you, Ryan. Can you give a little bit of intro of your background? Let's start before you even got into the agency world. A little bit about what was your upbringing like and how did you know that you were going to get into this creative marketing world? My background growing up, I mean, I guess my, just, let's just call it growing up because I think that's the question. So I'm the, <laughs> I'm the second of two boys. My brother uh, was the chosen one. He was the like if I ever went on millionaire, I'm calling my brother. He he'll know the answer. He is just off the charts smart, and <laughs> um, I that means I had to pick a different lane, which was the sports kid that watched a lot of television. And <laughs> you know, I didn't get into. I really stayed out of trouble, but I I also think it's not a mistake that as the younger brother, I would watch what my brother would do. And if he didn't get in trouble, I would do that. And if he did get in trouble, I wouldn't. So like the idea of being, uh, I call myself a compensated observationalist really started by me just being watching what my, what my brother did and deciding was that a good move for me or not followed by, I really watched a ton of TV growing up and it was really my babysitter. And my, my parents are great parents, but I just found, I was fascinated by TV at the time, there wasn't 3,000 channels. There was like six. And so I could actually watch all, all of television, which I think I did. And I was fascinated by commercials. You know, I was like, oh, that's funny. That's, that's not funny. That's cool. Oh, I see what they're trying to do there. So I would take my same observationalist ways and sort of look at uh, commercials that way. Now, this is where it gets cool. We used to spend our summers. I'm from Maryland originally. We would spend our summers in Delaware. Yes, that Delaware. Oh, 
Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, well, you know, for some people like Delaware, yes, that Delaware. <laughs> it comes with a question mark on the end, yeah. <laughs> and um, there was a family that always came down from New York. They were, we were always there at the same time. And they're like, Ryan, you would love Ithaca College. You, you know, you could actually, you're so funny, blah, blah, blah. You could study TV. I was like, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. There's schools where you could actually study TV? I'm, I am proficient at television. If there's anything I know, it's TV. <laughs> um, that was really it. I remember thinking, wow, there's actually hope for me that I could, I could do something with my time on this planet. And I went to television radio school in Ithaca. Loved it. And um, from there, got my first job, which was, was as a writer at an ad agency in New York City. It happened to be a 700-person agency back in 1998 and was just the most amazing learning ground because you're surrounded by really the end of what I would call the Mad Men, Mad Men like era, right, where advertising really, really mattered the way it was in the first round. Gosh, and that's 21 years ago. And you think about all the change from there, but I don't think it's a mistake that I've always been an observationalist and I always studied funny and what motivates people. And still 21 years later, I'm, I'm still doing the same sort of thing, just maybe in different spaces. Yeah, probably, probably a little bit different. Are you still a huge fan of TV or have you evolved your uh, consumption habits? Yeah, my habits have, have evolved. I still love content. You know, I love, I love the way I describe it. I, I love stories. You know, I think storytelling is everything. And um, the stories look different. The spaces those stories live in look different. The vessels where you send stories down look different. Sometimes you're putting the story directly into products now. The obvious places are social media. Like, this is what we're doing right now, right? Podcasts. This is a story. And it so is. I love that, fa that facet. Am I still watching TV? I mean, if you call Netflix TV and HBO TV, then yes. If you don't, then no. Sure. Yeah. It's definitely a yes with an asterisk. So give you both there. <laughs> but, but yeah, you can see from an early age that you had an interest in the marketing advertising world and in this, uh, the creativity and storytelling that comes with it. So I, for this next story, I would love for you to share where did IDEA, your agency come from? And, and I know you don't, work with it anymore and that's you yeah. know, a little bit different but we'll get to the other stuff later where, where did where did that baby come from yeah 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 and, and for the record I actually still own part of IDEA so uh, you know I, although my my day job and my focus is on some of the other things I'm doing but yeah I mean look I I moved um, I started my first agency in 2004 it was, it was really based baked out of stubbornness <laughs> And it wasn't like I had this business plan and oh, there's the white space and we're going to, and there's none of that. It was necessity and, and, and too stubborn to fail. That was fish tank, right? That was fish tank. And nearing um, 2011, you know, you saw all these changes if you were paying attention, right? That advertising wasn't the same. I think branding actually is the same, but that's another podcast for another time. <laughs> But, you know, where we told stories was changing. And so there was a PR and social media firm in-house. And I would call the, they were an organization. I was never that organized to be an organization, to be honest. We were always like a bunch <laughs> of really creative storytellers. But sometimes we'd have clients walk into our office and be like, oh, cool. Like they were almost surprised we had an office. Um, oh, so yeah. as times were changing... And we started pitching stuff together. Um, they were called Bailey Gardner, and I was Fish Tank. And we realized that, okay, we have something here. Can we actually come up with integrated ideas that live in all these different spaces and decided to, to merge the, the two universes together? Had an awesome ride, 2012 to 2017, took it to 70 people, Worked with like U.S. Ski and Snowboard, and Eddie Bauer, and Qualcomm, and um, just had a blast, man. It was like a lot of fun, a lot of talented people. And um, the, I, the name of IDEA, uh, there's the on the record and the off the record. I mean, the on the record is it's in our name what we do best, right? Like it's about powerful ideas, and then how do you power those ideas? And the company was actually split into those two universes. Mm. And then the off the record is, oh, wow, we can actually legally get IDEA as a name and be good. Um, and obviously, <laughs> you know, we know people are going to call us idea. Um, that's cool too. But that was, yeah. uh, that was sort of how it came to be. 
<laughs> it's not a bad term to be associated with a, a group, a, a team that's going to create ideas and execute ideas for you. So I think yeah. that, that, that worked out either way. But you mentioned some of the clients that you've had and and just looking through your history and some some case studies there, that is something that completely blew me away. I mean, you mentioned U.S. Ski and some of those other clients that you work with, but I, you know, I'm a huge baseball fan myself. So the fact that you work with the MLB as well as you know Subway, Puma, some of these top brands out there, can you give us a, a couple examples of uh, your some of your favorite projects or, or client experiences that you worked on? You know, w- way back in the day in the IDEA days. I mean, the two favorite, because I'm a sports guy too. So my, my two favorite are related to sports. Major League Baseball by far was probably number one, <clears throat> only because we, you know, when you start something new and you start from a market like San Diego, it's hard to compete with New York and LA. And so the fact that we were able to work with somebody of that caliber, like Major League Baseball, Number one is like what you've been waiting for. And then two, the insight was, well, this is interesting. Players give a decade at best. Free agency change the game. So players at, at best give a decade, but fans give a lifetime. Like I've, I'm a painful, you know, painful Orioles fan and a painful Padres fan. That's how I justify it, by the way. <laughs> and then my NL and my AL. I don't have this in any other sport, by the way, but <laughs> we give a we give a lifetime, but yet there was nothing honoring the fan, and so it just happened that the All Star Game was in San Diego, and we had come up with a Hall of Fan where we were going to actually enshrine a jersey of a fan, and the the concept was called Enshrine Mine, but it was really to play, pay off that insight, like to honor the people that that make the game the game, and often we put the athletes on a pedestal, but really we should be tipping our captain fans, so. Hall of Fan did that, and um, it was just nice to see like our ideas at the highest level playing well um, for Major League Baseball, you know, one of the most professional organizations on the planet. So that's one. U.S. Ski and Snowboard rebranding them, also an awesome um, opportunity just because, you know, I, the joke that I had made was you're called the U.S. Ski Team. That means you're the United States Ski Team, but you're, there's nothing united about the group because there were seven different marks, you know, uh, snowboarding right. had their mark, skiing had their mark, hmm. they all had their marks. And so our job was very, it was like a tricky job on like taking into consideration each of the seven teams and making sure that they had been heard. But at the end of the day, like how united are you really if we can't unite on one mark? And so, Taking 40 years of marks also and coming up with a new mark that could prepare them for the next 40 was part of the challenge. And we landed on an awesome shield, you know, because it's U.S. ski and snowboard. Um, the background ended up looking like the Rocky Mountains, and then there was three stars in the Rocky Mountains, right? So we're representing both the starry sky of, of the Rocky Mountains, but also like three stars. That's the podium, right? Like we want you to earn and shoot for the stars and try to get mm. uh, gold, silver, or bronze. So like – and then presenting it at their center of excellence and sitting up there with like guys like Steve Nyman, who's like a rock star Olympian and him saying, you know, I love wearing this mark because I feel like it's a competitive advantage for us. It makes me feel faster. And you talk about like the power of brand and power of what we do. And like, how awesome is that? That this guy who spent his whole life training for these moments, we actually gave him an asset of confidence for him to go out and do what he does. So, I think those two are my favorite. And by the way, the thing that's amazing about both of these examples is like I had rock star talent around me Mm -hmm. bringing these ideas to life. So this isn't like the Ryan Berman thing at IDEA. We really did have people capable of coming up with these powerful ideas that could break through this clutter of stuff you're seeing outside of the market right now. Yeah. Well, you obviously had a great team around you. I have a conspiracy theory that it was your creative genius that ultimately got Manny Machado to San Diego. I can't confirm nor deny that. Okay. All right. Well, we'll leave it at that. You plead the fifth. <laughs> but it's really cool that you worked on things that are in your passion area of sports and very outside of the box ideas, as you can see. And then after, so th- this also is, some people would say completely crazy. Some people would say completely awesome. I think it's a little bit of both. After you got mostly out of that agency, you started a sock company. <laughs> That's correct. 
So that's, <laughs> I mean, I, I think any reasonable person would do that after leaving their agency. But sock problems, which is really, really cool. And there's a charity and nonprofit aspect to it. Uh, How did you get the idea for that and uh, decide to actually move forward with, you know, full socks ahead with this? Yeah. Nice. Let's see what you did there. Um, Thank you. All right. So I think you have to go back to um, the agency and, and the growth of the agency. So I felt like we had hired well where I had brought in an, an executive creative director and they, there's like a, it's a little cliche now, but like there's that comment where like, are you working in the business or on the business? And like the goal is to get out of the business obviously and have um, hire, like surround yourself with talent that can, that can do it. And we reached a point where I really had surrounded myself with exceptionally creative people that didn't need me in the day to day. And what that allowed me to do is to basically land on the positioning of what I thought was going to be the position for IDEA. And the, the positioning was this concept of courage brands. And I'm like, I love what it sounds like. I have no idea what it means. Let me go see if I can come up with the definition of this thing. And that very quickly turned into a three year process, you know, which is actually now my book return on courage. Mm-hmm. And what I realized was every single time I had a client, and when we presented, like we would present multiple ideas and every single time they picked the most courageous idea, their return on courage was through the roof and I had a really happy staff. And every time they surrendered and went with the safer idea, the return on courage wasn't even half. And by the way, my staff was pretty upset because <laughs> they knew it wasn't going to work at the level <laughs> that, it, that it could have. So, so imagine like, okay, this, I'm going to write this book. I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to drop it off onto the laps of, you know, different potential business leads. And as I'm going through and interviewing all these amazing people from Google and Apple and Amazon and uh, Domino's or like brave people like Navy SEALs and astronauts and tornado chasers, and you'll see how this works the socks in a minute. You know, a few insights are sort of bubbling to the surface. The first is that, wow, wow, you can actually teach leaders how to unlock this in their teams. Like it's actually a skill. It's a teachable skill. And it's one we desperately need right now, but people don't even think they need it. So that's interesting enough. And a big part of courage is taking action. And so here I am going around the country interviewing all these people. And I have I've had the idea of sock problems since, gosh, I would say 2006 or seven. And <laughs> um, as I'm interviewing like these CEOs are founders of massive companies. I'm like, there's really no, in my head, I'm thinking this. I'm like, wow, it feels like there's not that much different other than that they took action and I haven't on this idea. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't shut that little voice off. And I'm like, how courageous am I really? If I'm going to sit here and write a book about courage, I should probably live the premise and be courageous myself. And so I say that was sort of the beginning of me finding the right partners for sock problems taking what I had learned on the journey of the book, which is basically finding people that share my values, but bring breadth of experience to the table, people that are good at things that I'm not. So my, my partnership originally was with a, an unbelievable operator who knew how to make the plumbing of a business go. And what I mean by that is we're a direct to consumer brand. So like if someone orders a pair of socks, like they go to sockproms.com, I guess I should explain the idea. So the, the whole idea is like <laughs> sock is a verb. That's it. So, like, what? How cool would it be if we socked problems in the world with socks? And each sock strives to sock a different problem. So if you wanted to sock racism, or you wanted to sock breast cancer, you wanted to sock bullying or sock extinction of animals, or climate change, um, we have a sock for you. That sock is designed particularly for whatever you're passionate about. If you want to sock hate and you're part of the LGBTQ community, we have a sock called Rainbow Pow, which is like this awesome, lovable sock of rainbows. And 25% of the sale price goes back to the Trevor Project on that particular sock. If you wanted to sock gun violence, 25% of the proceeds are going back to uh, Make Schools Safe, which is Lori Aldef's foundation. She lost her daughter down in Parkland, uh, in the Parkland shooting. And so one of the things that she did was start this foundation, and we support her for that. And so I'm like, why am I not doing this idea? So that that's how it sort of started was – How do I then find partners that can help me bring it to life? I'm passionate about using my superpower of creativity 
for good. And then thankfully found my two partners, one who really was the operator. I was the story. The other was like half money, half digital marketing. And that, that was how we started the company a little over a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And um, huh. we're having a blast. You know, we're having fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it's amazing. I mean, you, you've done such a wide range of things. And, and I love this idea for, for sock problems. It just in it, there's such a wide range of charities. Um, so you're doing really good things for the world. And it's cool that it came out of a place of just your personal experience and kind of putting your money where your mouth is and in your business where your mouth is there and with this new courage concept. So, so oh. it's really, really cool what you've done there. Thanks, man. Yeah, I call it my courage brand. You know, it's, it really is my courage <laughs> brand. So, yeah, we're going for it. Yeah, we are. Hey, wild listeners. Have you been wanting to start a podcast for yourself or your business, but didn't know where to start? Or do you have a podcast of your own, but you're struggling with the time commitment? I'd love to help. Shoot me an email at max at hippodirect.com with any podcasting questions you have. I'm also happy to jump on a 30-minute call where we can discuss your idea, planning, production, promotion, and other elements of the podcasting world. Let your podcast run wild. Let's go for it here in terms of courage. So courageous, you have, what do you technically call it, a consulting firm? Or yeah, uh, just, we call it like a special forces, like a special forces. Team. Ooh, I like Same that. All right. Team. Special forces. So you have courageous, you have your new book that launched at the start of 2019, Return on Courage, which actually I, a little bit earlier this year was flying back from my hometown in Cleveland, Ohio. And at the bookstore, it was Return on Courage. And I was like, holy cow, interviewing Ryan soon. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so that's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send you the picture and then you can autograph and send it. No, I'm just kidding. But um, <laughs> no, but um, it's, you know, I don't know how, how closely you track your distribution, but it's definitely in the Cleveland Hopkins airport. But you have this concept of courage. And before we dive more into it, I'd love to know, you know, out of all the character traits and concept or themes to focus in on, why courage? What stood out to you so much about courage that you literally pivoted your career to, to really hone in on it and, and help spread the message of so many amazing courageous people. Yeah. I, I think this is an absurdly fair question to ask. And, uh, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> that, that's a very nice uh, compliment for a question. <laughs> well, no, it, it, the truth is I feel like most of us don't have awareness on ourselves on why we're making the decisions we're making. And I can tell you for like the first 15 years of my career, it's sort of like a cocktail of Maslow meets imposter syndrome meets maybe I'm actually good at this meets ego meets focus. And we're so focused on just surviving or getting through it and that we don't have the level of clarity I think we should have as to why we're making the decisions that we're making. And the book writing process, like the big joke is I wrote the book to position a company and realized that I wrote the book because I needed the book. You know, I needed, I needed this book. Like I, I basically got to go away for three years and work on myself. And when I actually audited the decisions that I had been made making, a lot of it were, were courageous decisions. I just didn't see it that way until I finally was like, Oh wow, this, this word is, this is bigger than just a word to me. It's, it's how I've tried to live this whole, this whole life, you know, starting companies and moving to cities that I'd never been to, or, you know, when I really looked at it, I was like, Oh wow, there are tenets of courage and all the stuff that I'm doing. So it was real to me. It was genuine to me. Hmm. And then the more I started to study it in the workplace, so to, I guess the point of all that is I don't think it was a pivot. I think it was a realization that every move that I had made mirrored this idea. And now, well, why aren't we talking about it more then? And a lot of the early research that I had done was like, wow, business leaders don't see it relevant in their business. They're so focused on the day-to-day. -day. They're so focused on hitting their quarterly numbers if they're a public company. It isn't until you like tell them, okay, let's put the business on pause for one second and like, how does this word actually play? And um, then people are like, you know what? It might not be in the, the core focus, but it's a peripheral. And if I really think about it, it's exactly kind of what we need to get through this, this sort of mess of business right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And so I just kept following it and following it and following it. And it was like, wow, I, this is, I, I think if there was a, a word stock market, I'm, I'm buying low on courage, much like people bought low on emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And then Harvard started writing about emotional intelligence and that became the standard of the difference between good leaders and great leaders is EQ. And so I think that's kind of where we are right now. It's the, the difference between a, a good company and a great company comes down to how courageous is the leader. Because a courageous leader can create, you know, multiple courageous leaders. It can create a courageous culture. And if you have a courageous culture, you're going to create space to create courageous ideas and courageous innovation. And I just realized like that, that's kind of what we need. Like the only way people get noticed is with the courageous idea. Because when you're not there to defend that idea, and it hits the market, it, it better stand out. It better scream. And that's that's a bold idea that, that sort of separates you from the rest. So I really just followed the thread. Yeah. Tried to live the premise myself. And here we are today. When you think of this book, and I mean, that's kind of the background behind it, but what's the biggest thing that you hope that people take away and, and change after reading the book or, or, or focus on more after reading the book? Uh, I think it's it starts... You know, as cliche as it might be, I mean, you can learn how to be courageous. It's a teachable, learnable skill. And it starts Ooh, with... That's a good one. <laughs> that, that's good to know. You know, well, some people don't even think about it. It's like they're, they're not even open to the idea of that they are courageous. They think courage is for Navy SEALs. They don't see, you know, they, they bucket it under extreme courage, you know, not employer courage. And the way the book is written, the front half of the book is the why now, like why now of all things do I think courage is the answer? And I cover the four truths of the, what I call the business apocalypse and I won't go into it here, but like why now, like of all things is this the thing? And then assuming you buy in on the, the four truths, the back half of the book is the how, like how do you do it? Like how do you actually unlock this in your team? How do you unlock this in yourself? Like mm -hmm. do you have enough clarity to know why you're making the decisions that you're making? And, one of the big aha moments that I had was that if you don't know what you stand for, you never know when to take a stand. And to me, that is a massive problem in corporations is that nobody is taking a stand and everyone's trying to appease to group think everyone's trying to appease to the team. Everyone's trying to appease to the board. And, you know, so the book really does teach you to learn like, what are you all about? And then how do you build a team around that? And then how do you identify what could crumble your business? And then have you actually landed on something that could galvanize your team where they actually want to come to work every day? And then how do you continue to stay ahead of the competition and take action? And this might be a good point. You know, one of the, one of the aha moments of the book is we have the wrong idea of what courage is. The, 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 the dictionary definition is the ability to do something that frightens you. And I'm like, well, shoot, like, I, I don't think anybody wants to do that. Like, especially in the corporate workplace. <laughs> I yeah. can tell you that my wife, she's the chief executive officer of our family. And if I say something stupid or do something dumb and it gets me fired and we have to move, that's not going to sit well with the family CEO because you know, she really likes San Diego. Oh, probably not. Yeah. <laughs> so the idea is like, well, I wonder if you could teach people how to be calculated with their courage. And that starts with coming up with a definition that has a little bit of utilitarian value. So this is my, this is, this is the definition that I pose in the book that assuming there's willingness, courage is nothing less or more than knowledge plus faith plus action equals courage. And it needs to be all three. So in business, you're never going to have every bit of knowledge. You need to make a call, right? If you wait and you wait and you wait, you're going to get past. So like at some point you got to have enough knowledge you know, that your faith is building. And when I talk about faith, we're not talking about religion, we're talking about inner belief. So knowledge, right? Your knowledge goes up and then hopefully your faith goes up and then it's, it's go time. It's time to take action. And which is the hard part, right? Like, you know what you should do. You feel that it's right. Are you taking action or are you not? So that's, that's my definition. Knowledge plus faith plus action equals courage. And, and like I said, two or three in any direction is not courageous. So knowledge and faith with no action is paralysis, right? Faith and action with no knowledge is reckless and knowledge and action without faith. Like if you don't feel that thing on the inside, that little knot or that little voice is going, this is a little crazy right now. I'm not sure about this. If you don't hear that little voice or feel that then you have no faith, you're probably working on status quo. You're working on safe. Yeah. So that has to be all three. 
Oh, that's genius. And I, it's easy to understand, but you can go so deep into each of those areas and it's cool how they, they really work together, but you need all three. I, I'm just appreciative that you made it a, uh, a little addition equation as opposed to like a complex, you know, calculus derivative or integral thing. We don't need to get to <laughs> the detail there. So it's good. You don't need a graphic calculator for this. Well, what's great to your point also, Max, like my whole, like the whole concept of the special forces of courageous, mm-hmm. we have knowledge teams, we have faith teams and we have action teams. You know, phase one is knowledge gathering. Phase two is faith building. Phase three is action taking. So like we have processized everything that's in the book for the missions that we take on as a company to help our companies deal with the realities of change. And, and so that was the other, the reason that why I felt like I really had to leave IDEA was because I actually didn't think that organization was able to processize what we're trying to do at courageous. But when you start something new, like this is the process that's set from the beginning. If you buy in on the process, you're probably one of us. And if you're not, you're probably not. That, that's a much easier, it's almost easier to start something fresh and bring it out to market than try to change something that, that might not be changeable. Mm, yeah, and you use special forces. I mean, you use that as a, as a metaphor or analogy when you're talking about these courageous leaders. But in the book, you literally spend time with and, and learn from actual people in the special forces. Like you mentioned Navy SEALs earlier and um, it's everyone from Navy SEALs to executives at companies like Method and really, you know, companies that have a ton of momentum there and a wide, wide range of people there. How did you decide who would ultimately in the book is, would ultimately end up in the book? Uh, That's the first part of the question. It's a little tricky here. And then second part is how did you reach out and get connected to so many amazing people? The first answer is easy, right? The first answer is like, as you're going through and you're learning from all these amazing people, you're taking notes and you're just like, oh, that's interesting. It doesn't matter if it's the Navy SEAL or the CEO or the Cambridge PhD. They, they're all saying the same things, maybe differently, but the, the outcome is the same thing on the importance of communication or the importance of you know, providing clarity to your organization, whatever it might be. So to me, what, what made it in was just, just you go, let's go very back to the very beginning, like me being an observationalist and just really trying to do my diligence to connect the dots on what I had heard on this three-year journey. And if it supported like, oh, that's how you be, that's how you can be courageous. That's how you can do it in a modern way. And then it made it in the book. And, you know, obviously the book ended up at 55,000 words, but there's another probably, <laughs> hundred thousand words, fifty, you know, somewhere between seventy five thousand, hundred thousand words that didn't make the cut. And so <laughs> yeah. you know, whatever was essential made it in. Whatever wasn't essential didn't make it in. How I got to the, these amazing people is I can't really answer the question other than to say digital is the game changer. So like the fact that you can reach out to people yes. on LinkedIn you know, look at how you and I met, right? Like someone I trust was on your show and that's it. That's how it happens. And, and the <laughs> more people that, the more people you talk to, the, the more people probably learn about you. And similar mm-hmm. here, like the more I would blog about something and, you know, I, I, I would almost talk about like, I would I write a blog post on courage and then someone's like, what's this thing you're doing with courage? That's how I've always felt really strongly about that word. So in a roundabout way, I think because of technology, if you're really designing, you know, you're making content, just like you're making content, I'm making content, your people, when I say your people, your tribe, your community finds your stuff and it mirrors them. It's, it's like a song that doesn't mean anything until it does. Like you know, the song you probably had your first kiss to, you probably heard before. You just don't remember it because there was nothing meaningful associated with it until the kiss. And then they're like, oh, and now every time you hear that song, that's your song. And I think that's the similar thing here. Like you create a platform and for me, it's courage. And someone's like, yes, that's how I feel. Like, I feel like I am, you know, as a CEO, I am courageous in my organization. I wish I was surrounded by more people that were courageous. Maybe, maybe I can bring in Ryan and he can, they can hear it from somebody other than me. That's always good, a good trick, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> Great trick. <laughs> you know, it's like that, that we, cause we kind of need it. We kind of need to be more courageous. That's how I've always felt about myself. So uh, this is a roundabout way of saying like 
the more content you put out there that's on your brand, the more, of course, you're going to find people it resonates to. Absolutely agree. Last, last thing here for courage. You don't need to go too in depth because I know you cover a ton in the book, but if you could just point to one of your, one of your experiences throughout your three years of research here that just completely blew you away or caught you off guard, what comes to mind when I ask you that? Yeah, there's, this is an easy one. So it's, it's, no, by, it's Loretta Hidalgo, who is a, a, one of the founding astronauts, I believe, at Virgin Galactic. And um, this is like at the very beginning of the book writing process. And I, to be honest, didn't really know <laughs> what I was writing. You know, still like, I think I'm on to something. <laughs> and the universe yeah. decided to have her be my first in-person interview. And um, when I went up and met with her, I had my own fears. Like I didn't want to ask a stupid question to an astronaut or... Of course. I mean, everybody goes across that, right? Yeah. Well, I know you and I do. Uh, we That's confirmed on this <laughs> podcast. Yeah. But I remember getting there for lunch and before the trays even at the table, she's like, so what makes you qualified to write a book about courage? Well, touche astronaut. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> what do you mean? I've been writing, uh, it's hard to write pithy one-liners behind a laptop, hiding behind a laptop for a career for Twitter. Yeah. If only you were in outer, outer space when you did it, right? Yeah, I know. Shame on me. That would have, maybe maybe that'll be the second book. And <laughs> she basically goes, no, 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 no. You, you're putting the emphasis where, where I'm not. She's like, you got to figure out why you're writing this book. I didn't tell you to write this book. And she proceeded to tell me that her definition of success was when there's no daylight between the personal her and the professional her. And that sunk in because as a guy that's been in the service business for 20 years, sometimes we surrender ourselves and we – agree to things we shouldn't or we bite our lip or we take that call at 11 p.m. And I had felt like I had sort of surrendered myself 1% at a time over a period of years. And so at that moment, I'm like, you know what? Part of this book writing journey is to like figure out who, who the heck I am and can I actually be that person in everything I do moving forward? And um, like I said, I, I think it was a gift that Loretta was at the beginning of the book writing process and I think that's a big part of the book. It's, it is really doing the hard work to understand what you're all about. And once you know who you are, again, to, to go back to that, if you don't know what you stand for, you never know when to take a stand. And that means having an honest conversation about what you're all about. My hope is the book helps people, not just the company, but the leaders and the people figure that out for themselves. And you have some out of this world examples, as you've clearly noted. So thank you for that. We're going to switch gears a little bit and get to a section on inspiration and creativity. So here, think about people that inspire you, hobbies, you know, resources that you consume. First question, what do you do to stay creative? Gosh, it's like, actually, it's the other way around. <laughs> I mean, my, whole, my whole day is creativity. Everything is creativity. So <laughs> what do you do to bore yourself? Yeah, what do I do to step away from creativity is, for me is a better uh, question. And what I do is exactly that. Like I play, I still play soccer um, while, while I have my knees. So just like walking away from, from a project and being able to do something that I really love that reminds me of like life as a, when I was 13 years old, just being able to do that. That's one of the, the beauties of being in San Diego. Yeah. Spending time with my kids, I travel a lot right now. So I have a six year old and a three year old, just like trying to find some time for them. And the rest of my time is really like I almost like I'm fluent in metaphor, right? So it's like, how do I, how do, you know, how do I step away from that and open up space? So when I come back to it, I'm strong and ready to go again and, and revitalized. Yeah. Have you thought like, have people called you out for that before that you literally just use metaphors all the time? Like I, I, I tend to think in puns a lot. So I just kind of like puns come out without even thinking of it, but it's like, it's kind of hard to separate yourself from doing that. Again, if my people are into it, then they stick around and if they're, they're rolling their eyes and they move on, but <laughs> I'm certainly not going to change, you know? Right. <laughs> well, yeah, you're aware of the highway. What are some of your favorite, you mentioned that you consume a good amount of content there. Um, and you mentioned Netflix. So first I have to ask you, what's your favorite Netflix show right now? Right now, it's sort of a tricky spot. I'm sort of in between, right? Because I was a huge mm -hmm. Ozark fan. I'm um, looking forward to oh, coming yes. back. Ready for Stranger, Th Stranger Things 3, but I'm trying to put a hold on that until I'm with my family, uh, like my brother and his family at the beach so we can all watch together. Those are really the two 
that I'm most into. Oh, those are, you know, all time ones. But what what I'm getting at is, you know, you consume that to kind of clear up your head and get away from your, your sort of day to day there. What else do you do? I mean, do you, are there books that you like or podcasts that you listen to? You know, what, what do you like to dig into from that regard? Just any names that come to mind. Uh, let's see here. Well, obviously your podcast, Max, is... <laughs> oh, stop, stop. Thank you. <laughs> You're like, I did not pay him to say that. Not yet. It's coming. Yeah, no, look, I, I honestly, I, I feel like I did so much research on the book. Uh, right now, I where I get my information is probably Googling it. And, and like there'll be times that I'll actually Google like viral. I'll actually Google the word just because I'm curious of what comes up. Mm, um, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Look at these five things. I never thought about that. Right? Yeah. And so like, let's use the tools that we have. And, um, and, and, you know, and I'm also speaking at a ton of conferences now. So what's great is that I'm, I'm interacting with a bunch of other speakers um, getting to see their content. I'm getting to see their case studies and the ones that really are, you know, rising to the top. In my opinion, you know, you learn from them. You, you, you can be vulnerable with them too and ask questions on like their stuff. And so I'm learning from, from that and I'm learning, learning from the Google machine and um, having fun doing it. <laughs> it's a blast. Yeah. I'm so glad the Google machine is, is here for us. So, so that's inspiration and creativity. We only got a little bit of time left, so there's a couple quick segments I want to hit on. One is a fan favorite segment, a recurring segment here called the Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. The Wild Business Shoutout of the Week! Oh, boy. <laughs> it's my, my reaction usually as well. But uh, Wild Business Shoutout of the Week, this is where we talk about a recent campaign that caught our attention. And there's something that involves sharks, but probably not what most people would think of. Can you, you mind... Uh, giving us a little bit about that example? Yeah, sure. So so I think in order to set this up properly, one of the things I talk about in the book is like it's not enough to know your why anymore. You got to put a rally cry in that why. There has to be like without a rally cry in your why, you're not going to have a staff that sticks around. Like If there's not true conviction, your staff's going to leave. And one of the um, sort of, well, wait a minute, not only like the companies that are winning – like a SpaceX, like SpaceX, there's not a ton of proof that they're going to be successful on their purpose, their why, which is life on another planet. But they put a rally cry in their why, which is why people stick around for that story. People are willing to work 18 hours a day for SpaceX to, to fulfill their mission. But like very recently, I've also been like, huh, you know what? It's not just putting a rally cry in your why. The companies that are really winning are also putting a rally cry in their what. They're actually building the rally cry in the product. So what I mean by this is there's a little company called Lush Shark Soaps, and they literally are trying to save the ocean ecosystem. And the way they went about doing it is they, uh, they literally created a soap that looks like a shark. <laughs> it's six bucks. A hundred percent of the proceeds go to helping sharks. And you, their take on it, by the way, is it's very much like bees. Like we need sharks for the, the ecosystem of the water. And I believe a hundred percent of the sales, from their shark fin soap supports the Rob Stewart Shark Water Foundation. And it's a soap bar. That's all it is. It's just a soap bar that looks like, like a shark. Meanwhile, this thing's been retweeted <laughs> like over 70,000 times already. And so this is what I mean by a rally cry, not just in your why, but in your what. Like they literally created, put the purpose into the product, which is I think where our business is going. Like how do you basically – unsilo marketing where the, the story is baked into the product very much like what I'm trying to do with sock problems, right? Like the product is the story. We're socking problems with socks. These guys yeah. had, had done a really nice job at a uh, lush shark soaps to, to make this thing go and go viral. <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of funny because it's like, sometimes it's just the smallest little tweaks to, you know, household products or items that people have used for, years or sometimes even decades and centuries that just makes them buzz there. But uh, we were talking, you shared with me the photo earlier and I just, it, <laughs> there's something about this little bar of soap with the shark fin coming out that is just so special and so memorable that I'm not surprised it's blowing up like that. But I really, I really like that example. And they're obviously for a, have a powerful mission that they're passionate about. So yeah. I'm excited to see. And I, by the way, the responses were back and forth. Like some people were like, uh, yeah, good. Get rid of sharks. But then like, the other side, they, <laughs> they made the case that evidently like 90% of the shark population is gone or decreased in the last 40 years. Wow. And um, huh. that's because of, of us. So 
this this group, the Robert Stewart Sharkwater Foundation, 100% of the proceeds from the soap is going back to them to try to fix this. Wow. Okay. So that was Wild Business Shout on the Week. I know uh, we got to run here soon, but I'd love to wrap up with some rapid fire Q&A real Do it, quick. Do man. Bring on the rapid fire. You ready for it? I think so. All right. Let's, let's get wild. Yeah, you never know for sure. Uh, if you owned a cruise ship, what would you name it? I would call it um, Cruise It or Lose It. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Okay. Who's your favorite courageous fictional character of all time? Okay, I'm going with Harry Potter. I really did that. No, oh, expecto patronum there. How about, what's your biggest pet peeve? People that are not prepared. Sorry, I wasn't prepared for that one. Uh, how about, what's your biggest quirk? Besides anything that you've mentioned previously, like the different aspects about personality, what's your biggest quirk? Something maybe your wife or kids call you out for that is pretty unique, but also pretty cool in your eyes and probably my eyes too. I'm insanely superstitious with where I watch my, my sports teams. Oh, can you, can you reveal anything about that or you like don't even want to talk about it? No, I can't. That's, I'm superstitious. No, <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, no, no, but like, I think that things have meaning where they don't, you know, we're meaning making machines and sports is no different. So that's my biggest quirk by far. I'm like, if I do this, the Redskins are going to lose and I can't do that. And by the way, obviously the Redskins, lose all the time so I, it's my fault basically it's because you're doing that it's clearly because exactly. you're doing that. yeah <laughs> okay and then what uh and then super random what's your favorite music video of all time oh my gosh uh this is a tough one uh let's see here my favorite music video of all time <laughs> or just any music video you can think of that might be a, no, a well, uh, i'm trying to do this the right way i mean i look anything arcade fire does i'm in on so I love like the Arcade Fire, you know, is it a music video? Is it a, is it a music experience? And I think Arcade Fire probably takes the cake. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I'm a big fan of cake as well. A nice segue there. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> I, I know we got to wrap up. Thank you so much, Ryan, for, for coming on the podcast and sharing all the amazing things you've been up to and all the stuff with Courageous and Return on Courage. Really appreciate it. Where's the best place for people to connect with you? And also, where can they find the book? So uh, probably ryanberman.com is where you can find whatever you need on me or couragebrands.com, depending on what floats your boat. Uh, you can buy the book on uh, Amazon, Shock, audiobook. If you really like my voice, you're going to get stuck with me for six hours. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Congratulations. Well, if you speed it up, if you put it on like a 2X, then I think it's like three hours, right? So look at that math skills. So same thing I think, again, again with the math. Yep. RyanBurman.com, CourageBrands.com, or just Amazon and Audible. You can find the work there. Cool. Yeah. Float your boat and cruise it or lose it. And final thing here, final thoughts, Ryan, the stage is yours, whatever you want. It could be a quote. It could be a line. Send us off here. The secret to success is constancy and purpose. And uh, this is from Benjamin Disraeli. And it's a quote that my, my dad Put on the old paperweight and gave it to me for my desk. It's still sitting on there that now. And you know, I think having intention of what you want to do. And then, you know, my personal mantra is patiently relentless. So that means I may not get there overnight, but I know where I'm trying to go to and I'm going to stay, stay true to it. So once you know what you, what you want, uh, enjoy the journey and good luck getting there. Absolutely. Paperweight and all. That was patiently relentless. Thank you so much, Ryan, and thank you, wild listeners, for being the best. For more metaphors and puns with a business twist, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite app and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also dive into our marketing and entrepreneurial resources at hippodirect.com slash blog and hippodirect.com slash newsletter. That newsletter is the Hippo Digest, and it's your weekly recap of creative marketing from all around the web. And, of course, come say hey on your favorite social media platforms at the handles hippodirect.com and Max Brandstetter. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos! <laughs> <laughs>